GiveWell has so far made one grant in this area to the Center for Pesticide Suicide Prevention. James will talk about what GiveWell learned assessing this opportunity and how the process differed from assessing more direct interventions. James is a research consultant at GiveWell, having previously worked at, the, at Giving What We Can as a researcher and consulted for the World Health Organization. He is currently investigating several interventions aimed at influencing public health policy in developing countries. These include preventing suicide through means restriction, tobacco control, and reducing environmental exposure to lead. If you have any questions for him throughout the talk, feel free to submit them in the Bizabo app and find him afterwards for office hours. Join me in welcoming James to the stage. Thanks, Roxanne. Um, so hello, everyone. My name is James Snowden. I'm a, I think that's working OK. I'm a research consultant at GiveWell. Um, so I thought today it would be a good opportunity for us to kind of dis discuss and talk about how we're trying to push the boundaries of our research um, beyond the work that we kind of have traditionally done. Um, particularly, I kind of want to talk about GiveWell incubation grants, which I think are probably less well known in the EA community because they're the grants that we make kind of independently of, of other donors. Um, and within that, I then want to talk about how we're kind of trying to look at more interventions, which are basically kind of forms of advocacy to uh, influence government policy. And within that, um, talk about kind of a grant that I spent a long time this year reviewing, uh, which is uh, Centre for Pesticide Suicide Prevention. Um, so I'm going to, before I do any of that, I'm going to kind of quickly run through, for anyone who's not familiar about GiveWell and what we are and who we, you know, who we are and what we do, um, I'll be quite kind of quick with that because I think most people here kind of have a rough idea about um, who GiveWell are. But if you don't, if you're new to GiveWell, that's great. Um, feel free to kind of ask any questions at the end or come to my office hours. Um, so GiveWell are a non-profit and our role is to identify out outstanding giving opportunities um, based on uh, well, evidence-backed, cost-effective and transparent organisations. Um, and then we publish all the rationale for our uh, recommendations online. Um, and every year, we publish a list of our top recommended charities that we think um, are some of the best opportunities uh, for donors with kind of effective altruism-like principles um, to do good. Um, so we're generally focused on global health and development. Um, we put a lot of weight and transparency, publish all our research online, and we're independently funded, uh, non-profit. We don't take a cut of the money that goes to our charities. Um, so just to kind of quickly run through our top charities, I think the top four most people will already be familiar with, so the Against Malaria Foundation, um, distributes anti-malarial bed nets in sub-Saharan Africa, the Schistosomiasis Control Initiative, and the Deworm the World Initiative, uh, conduct deworming programs in India and sub-Saharan Africa, and give directly um, is an organization which gives cash transfers directly to very poor people in Kenya and Uganda. Um, so at the end of 2016, we added three new top charities, which I think maybe may, most people in EA might be less familiar with. Um, so the End Fund and Site Savers are two more deworming organizations, and Malaria Consortium run a seasonal malaria chemo prevention program um, in areas where malaria is prevalent. Uh, so I think rather than kind of dwelling on our top charities, and you can see all the information that you'd like for that online, I'll talk about um, some of our work that we're doing to identify new top charities and to, um, to a certain extent, seed new top charities. Um, and this is basically involves getting involved earlier in the life cycle of the charity and helping them kind of reach the scale or demonstrate the track record that we would need to see to consider them as, as a future top charity. Uh, so there are three different elements to our incubation grants. Um, so the first is scaling potential top charities. So there are some kind of various interventions which have a kind of strong evidence base or a moderately strong evidence base, but we haven't yet identified an organization that we can you know, feel has the track record to become a, a top charity. Um, so we're getting involved earlier in the life cycle of the charity and helping them come to scale. Uh, so one example of that is No Lean Season, which is an organization that so came out of Evidence Action Beta, which is the same organization that runs Deworm the World. Um, and they give incentives uh, either through grants or microloans um, to rural agricultural workers in Bangladesh um, to migrate to uh, the cities during the agricultural lean season. Um, and there's quite a lot of, well, there's some promising evidence that shows that this has an impact on consumption um, over that year. And then the next year, often you don't need uh, additional incentives and people will just re-migrate. 
Uh, another one that kind of came out of the EA community was Charity Science Health. Um, so they work on SMS uh, reminders um, to remind people to get immunized. Uh, and another example is a Center for Pesticide Suicide Prevention, which I'll talk a bit more about later. Um, you know, the second part of our work uh, is building, building the monitoring and evaluation we would need to kind of feel confident in a charity, uh, again, being recommended as a top charity. So we're working with an organization called ID Insight, um, who run randomized controlled trials on the ground. Um, and particularly, kind of one you know, thing we're very excited about is a randomized controlled trial of new incentives program. So it's another organization that came out of the EA community and runs conditional cash transfers, uh, again, to incentivize immunization. Um, and then the third kind of bracket is, is funding research. So this is basically work to help us make better decisions about which organizations we should be recommending. Um, so we recently gave a grant to the Center for Effective Global Action, so SEGA, um, to investigate various randomized controlled trials and see if we could follow up on them 10 years later and see what the long-term effects of those interventions were. Um, we're excited about this because it's a very, the long-term effects of interventions play quite a big role in our, um, in our analysis, particularly deworming. And there's actually just a complete dearth of information kind of looking at well, what are the effects 10 years, 20 years down the line. Um, so the idea here is rather than running a new randomized control trial from the start and kind of waiting 20 years spending a lot of money, we can just look at other studies that we can follow up on 10 to 20 years later, find the original participants, and then see what the effect was there. So I think one of the kind of areas of research that we're particularly excited about within incubation grants, within our intervention research more generally, is kind of trying to push our boundaries beyond um, the kind of relatively easy to evaluate direct health interventions that we've traditionally worked on. Um, we still, you know, we're, we're still putting a lot of effort into making sure that we've identified all the interventions within our kind of traditional scope, um, which should be top charities, but we're also thinking about you know, how can we evaluate things which are just harder to think about. So one particular area um, that we're interested in is policy. So this is basically charities that Rather than implementing a program directly, their, their goal is to influence government policy. Um, and you know, generally, we're looking at public health at the moment um, and choosing particular policies that we think have some evidence of uh, having a track record of success in the past. So four areas that we're looking at. Pesticide regulation, and I know I'm kind of dangling this pesticide thing in front of you. Um, we are gonna talk about that later. Uh, the second one is tobacco control. Um, third is lead regulation, so um, when children ingest lead, blood lead levels go up and it has an effect on their cognitive development. Um, and the fourth is motorcycle helmet laws. Um, so basically advocating to get the government to pass these laws. And so I think there is some pretty, there's a pretty good intuitive case for you know, why this might be an area where we think that we can do even better than our top charities. Um, so one is that they're very high leverage opportunities. They generally require spending a relatively small amount of money uh, on an organization to go and advocate to the government who will then spend a relatively large amount of money actually implementing the program. So you achieve some kind of leverage there. Uh, the second is that they're sustainable. So because it's government's actually implementing the program, you might think kind of in the long term you don't get a, maybe a fragmented health system or some of the kind of criticisms that you often get from direct intervention. Um, the third is that well, there has been some track record of success. So motorcycle helmet laws in Vietnam um, are estimated to have uh, saved a lot of lives and tobacco control, tobacco taxes in, in the Philippines um, significantly reduced the number of people who, who smoked there. Um, and the fourth, I think, is that the barrier to these, these policies being implemented often isn't it's often not political. It's often just a lack of capacity for effective regulation. And so you have the same kind of argument there within policy as you would within kind of health interventions. If you have this kind of low hanging fruit where things which have already been implemented in high income countries just haven't been done yet in low income countries. Um, having said that, I think there are some kind of limitations or, or reasons that it's particularly difficult to look at this area. Um, one is that you often just have a lower quality evidence base. It's harder to be certain about the effect size of a particular program. Um, and that's because it's often hard to run a randomized controlled trial on a program which is just rolled out across the whole country at the same time. Um, it's very difficult to find a comparison and work out what the counterfactual was. Um, second is that 
often with these kinds of uh, opportunities, it's very hard to kind of attribute the causality, of, like creating legislative change to a particular organization. It's lots of organizations kind of all working together, all working on kind of slightly different aspects of a problem um, and all contributing to, uh, to, to some kind of change in policy. Um, and it's very hard to isolate you know, which of these organizations was crucial and which wasn't. Um, the third risk, I think, is just there's a high chance of failure. It's hard to change government policy. Um, and the fourth, uh, I think, something kind of to be extra careful about is regulation in particular can have negative effects. Um, and you have to be really careful about that, I think, probably to an even greater extent than you would be um, with other kinds of interventions. Um, so now I'm going to talk about uh, the first grant we made in this area, which was to the Centre for Pesticide Suicide Prevention. Um, I'm going to focus on kind of the lessons that we learnt as funders trying to work out, you know, is it a good idea to fund this organisation? Um, straight after this talk, actually, Leah Yesheva, um, who's a policy director at CPSP, will be talking more about kind of the details of what they're doing, their activities, um, and their rationale for doing them. So just to kind of give you a brief introduction to pesticide suicide and what it is. Um, so it's basically suicide by people deliberately drinking poisonous pesticides. It's somewhere between 110,000 and 170,000 deaths a year, um, which is you know, relative to about 800,000 total suicides. It's one of the most common methods of suicide. And I think it's one that, certainly in my experience, most people haven't heard of. Uh, it normally happens in rural agricultural communities in Southeast Asia, um, where people have easy access to pesticides. Um, and it's also yeah, sub-Saharan Africa as well, but we're focusing our work right now on, on India and Nepal. So what's the intervention? Uh, so in the 1990s in uh, Sri Lanka, well, Sri Lanka had one of the highest suicide rates in the world in the 1990s. Um, and most of this was uh, from pesticide. So you see this top line here shows the uh, uh, pesticide suicide rate over time. And this is kind of other forms of suicide, which is relatively low. So the second most common form is, uh, second most common method is hanging. Um, so you see here this like sharp increase. Uh, I mean, my best guess about what's going on here is that's um, the period of the Green Revolution. So pesticides are being imported into Sri Lanka uh, in a quantity which never existed before. And so people have access to this new, new method of, of suicide, which didn't exist before. Um, so the charity, the Centre for Pesticide Suicide Prevention, um, we were approached by Professor Michael Edelston, who's a toxicologist at Edinburgh University, um, and Dr. Leah Ishava, who's a public policy expert. Um, and Michael had worked in Sri Lanka, uh, gathering data on which pesticides were most commonly used in suicide, and importantly, which had the highest case fatality. Um, and he wanted to do the same thing in India and Nepal, and hopefully with a similar result, trying to bring down the suicide rate. So as a best guess, we think there's about 50,000 pesticide suicides a year in India. So it is a very significant cause of death. So I think there are three big lessons that I learned from evaluating this proposal. I, I just want to, want to go through them because I think it's, it might be interesting to kind of highlight some of the, the problems that we have trying to work out the, the real effect of various interventions and working out who we should fund. So the first one is um, we have to take a different approach to assessing evidence when you're looking at something like this. So if you go back to this graph, I mean, this is just a time series data. Right? I mean, this is just over time, pesticide suicides went up. A thing happened here uh, where various pesticides were banned and here, and you see this sharp decline. Now, there's lots of different explanations for what could have caused this. Um, I mean, this is why it's so important to have you know, well-powered randomized controlled trials. Uh, but in this case, we just don't have that data. And so, you know, when, when you don't have really strong data, well, what do you do? Um, and it's, it's maybe a different mentality where, you know, if we're trying to work out how effective bed nets are, we can look at a meta-analysis of eight randomized controlled trials that give us a pretty good idea about what the effect size is on mortality. Um, here, you've got to kind of look at various different studies and work out, well, what's, what's actually going on? What's the most plausible thing that's compatible with the broad uh, sweep of the evidence. So I think there are three major categories of data points that kind of fed into my judgment about whether this would be an effective intervention. So the first is observational studies in Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Jordan, and Korea. Um, so in each of those countries, you'd seen pesticides banned and then a decline in suicides. Um, so I think on their own, that wouldn't have been good enough for me. 
Uh, again, there's just lots of other explanations for what could have caused this. Uh, the second is that if you look at the medical records um, in Sri Lankan hospitals, and this is the work that Michael was doing in Sri Lanka, and you look at the different pesticides, you can separate okay, how many people came to the hospital having ingested this pesticide and how many of them died. And so you can work out which, which of those pesticides were most likely to result in death. And the most toxic ones had a case fatality of somewhere between 40 and 60%. And the least toxic ones, well, it was 0%. Um, and so there's kind of a plausible story here going on, right? Like, if you ban the most toxic ones, which is what happened, and then people are substituting less toxic ones, then people will still be attempting suicide. Uh, but they'll generally not be succeeding in some sense. And so you can reduce deaths without necessarily reducing attempts. And the third thing is we did kind of see this, this does look like what was going on. So after these highly toxic pesticides were banned, you still did see people you know, coming into hospital with pesticide poisoning, but it was generally with less toxic pesticides and people were surviving more. So I think that's one plausible story. Right? And it seems like it fits the evidence to me, but I think a really important thing here is you've just got to think, well, there's other things that could have been going on. Um, and so we kind of went through a few different hypotheses of what could be happening. Uh, so one is that you did see a, a decline in unemployment in Sri Lanka over this period. And unemployment is associated with, strongly associated with suicide. Um, the decline in unemployment wasn't significant enough to, to cause a drop like this, but it might have contributed um, in some way. I think another really obvious one is uh, in the 90s and early noughties, um, Sri Lanka was embroiled in a civil war. Uh, and this could have influenced the suicide rate through various different mechanisms. So one possible mechanism is when uh, there, was a, there was a big push by the Sri Lankan government here against the rebels. Um, and so a lot of agricultural workers were joining the army and spending time away from home. And you're spending, spending time away from home, you're less likely to commit suicide through pesticide. We don't have any data to back this up, but you know, this might have happened. Um, and it's, yeah, again, that, that's one that troubles me slightly. It's, it's possible, but the kind of the major dates of the Civil War don't, just don't quite line up with, um, with, with this decline here. Uh, I think a third really important option is it's possible there, was, uh, there were high levels of rural to urban migration. Um, so when people move from the country to the city, they're less likely to be working with pesticides all the time, and you'd expect this, this rate to fall. Um, Sri Lanka, unlike China in this period, didn't see a big move of people moving from uh, rural communities to urban communities. So Sri Lanka has also seen a lot, uh, sorry, China has also seen a large reduction in pesticide suicide over time. And we think that probably was driven by rural to urban migration, but it probably wasn't the case in Sri Lanka. Um, another option is just obviously just have to look at other countries and work out, you know, is this actually a large decline relative to other countries and relative to other similar countries? Um, and yeah, we thought that was the case. So I think we're not, we're not certain in this. It's really hard to know that you've identified all the other possible mechanisms, um, and I'm sure we haven't. But our best guess of what's actually going on is that there's been a large decline in suicide, and this has at least partially been driven by uh, the ban on the most toxic pesticides in 1995 and 1998. So uh, another lesson we learned, or another difficulty we had, is when you're thinking about Advocacy interventions, it's not just, you know, how effective would it be if this thing happened? It's what's the chance of success? What's the chance of actually influencing the government to do the thing um, that they otherwise wouldn't have done? Now, we're quite early in, I think, our stage of learning about how to do this. And so we don't think we've got the most perfect process. Um, but generally, I can kind of talk you through the quality of data points, like fed into our judgments, and then kind of, you know, the judgments that we made, and then the steps that we're taking to improve. So one is that we'd, ha we'd seen indication of interest from the ministries of agriculture. Um, so Nepal in particular, they seem very keen for CPSP to come and work in their country, um, which I think makes it much more likely that they are actually going to be able to have the, make the change that they're, they're trying to achieve. Uh, second is that our impression was that uh, Michael Edelson in particular already had good relationships with um, rural sentinel hospitals where he'd have to go to collect the data on pesticide suicide. Um, and the third, of course, is just that there was a track record of success. And we interviewed the pesticide registrar in Sri Lanka who told us that um, their pesticide bans might well not have happened if it wasn't for his work collecting um, that data. 
So kind of putting this all together, uh, we kind of came up with our own quantitative estimates. Of, you know, what do we think the probability is of success? So I guess 55%. Ellie, who's our executive director, guessed 33%. Um, and so these are kind of, they're slightly made up numbers. I mean, th these are the kind of judgment calls that you have to make um, when you're assessing something that's just a bit more complex. Uh, and one thing that I'm quite excited about, so we're partnering with the Good Judgment Project, um, you might have come across, and they specialize in turning kind of qualitative data into kind of a probabilistic estimate. And we're gonna be tracking their, their they're gonna be updating their estimate over time. And we'll see you know, how closely it tracks the truth. Um, So that's the second thing. The third thing um, that I had to think quite carefully about was when you're regulating things, there are lots of potential negative consequences here. So pesticides are really useful. Um, they're useful for agriculture and they're useful for disease control. Uh, so I think, again, it's, it's very hard to rule out some kind of negative impact from banning particular pesticides. Um, I think two reasons that I don't think this is likely to be major. Uh, so there was a study done in Sri Lanka around the time of these pesticide bans, and you didn't see a noticeable decline um, in agricultural output or any noticeable increase in uh, agricultural inputs, in the cost of agricultural inputs. Um, now, this study wouldn't have detected a very small effect, say under 1% um, decline in agricultural output, and that would be enough, I think. A 1% decline in agricultural output would, be, would give at least a strong argument to say, you know, we recognize that this thing could be effective, but it's not worth the trade-off. Um, so I think another data point that kind of influenced my, my kind of thinking about this is just, there's a lot of pesticides, there's hundreds of different kinds of pesticides. Um, and it's true that some are kind of more useful in particular, particular uses, and they're all kind of specialized in a particular way. Um, but to give you kind of an example of, of how often various pesticides are banned, uh, so Mozambique recently banned 79 different pesticides. Um, for reasons completely unrelated to suicide um, and saw no, no evidence of an, any impact on agriculture. Um, and we're talking here about banning you know, two or three select pesticides which are very commonly used in suicide. So I think that put my mind at ease. Um, it is still something we're monitoring and we're going to have to be very careful about. And the other one is kind of easier to answer. So the insecticides used in suicide uh, just aren't the same ones um, that are used in disease control. So. Uh, pyrethroids, which are used in anti-malarial bed nets, uh, and DDT, which is used in indoor residual spraying to, uh, to prevent malaria. Um, they are not commonly used in suicide, and they have very low case fatality rates. So pyrethroids aren't even, um, they're not toxic in mammals. So I think those, those were the kind of the three things I learned. Um, so just to sum up, I think there is a, there's an intuitive case for vertical policy. And what I mean by vertical policy is rather than going in and trying to build capacity, policy making capacity, um, you're choosing a particular intervention that you think has strong evidence and then funding a group to basically provide technical assistance um, in implementing that. Um, but I find it quite difficult to analyze this stuff in the abstract. I mean, there are arguments on both sides. So I think the best way to really work out if this is an area we want to move into um, is to analyze particular cases and see how they stack up against our top charities. Um, and I think there are kind of three things that we learned evaluating these opportunities. So one, we have to take a different approach to assessing evidence. Uh, two is we have, to have a, we have to improve our process for assessing the chance of success. And the third is just being extra careful about negative consequences and making sure you're doing good research there. Um, so in the pesticide case, we thought this was a gamble worth taking, and you're going to hear more from uh, Leah just after this talk. Um, but it is too early to say how it's going. Um, but it's certainly something we're excited about. Cool, thank you. That's uh, the end of my talk, and uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to any questions. Great, thanks so much. Cool. I really appreciate this profile. Um, unfortunately, we have pretty limited time for a Q&A, so I'll cool. just That's fine. hand you one, and then if people want to ask additional questions, you can find them in office hours. Yeah, so uh, someone from the audience asked, or they, they noted that the examples you gave were pretty practical, um, and wondered if GiveWell uh, intends in the future to dive into some more complex systemic change interventions, like promoting democracy or promoting peaceful conflict solutions. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so we don't have short-term plans to do that. Uh, we talk about it a lot. Um, and we're always kind of thinking about, you know, what's, what's the areas that we haven't covered yet that we should be moving into next? I think generally our approach to broadening our scope is rather than just to dive straight in there with, you know, how can we promote economic growth? How can we create systemic change? 
These are very difficult questions. Um, and so we thought, okay, let's start from where we are now. Let's move outwards. Let's do things which kind of fit with our expertise, but will also hopefully help us learn how to evaluate these kinds of policy interventions better. And then maybe in the future we can you know, move to even more complex things. All right, sounds great. We're gonna have to call it there, but thank sure. you again. Yeah, really appreciate works. that.